And thank you all for being here. I know it's very busy at the beginning of the semester, so uh, it's great to see you all uh, this morning. Can I see a show of hands? How many of you are students at Georgia Tech or elsewhere? Okay. Uh, any visitors who are outside of Georgia Tech? Okay, couple people. Thank you. That's good to know the audience. So I know um, many of the students here are uh, in the supply chain program. So what I'll talk about today is not exactly 100% in supply chain, but we will have a lot of connections. So I'll try to point out those connections when possible. Uh, some of the discussion or examples are also going to use analytics more broadly, operations research management science tools. Um, even if the application may not be directly in supply chains, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to make some connections there. Um, and if you end up not liking this seminar very much, please come back for the next one because I promise the next one is going to be much more focused to supply chains which may be a little bit better aligned with, uh, with your interests. But uh, hopefully uh, this one is also going to tell you some new things. Uh, so I am the, I'm a faculty member in the School of Industrial Engineering and I also direct the Center for Health and Humanitarian Systems. It's an interdisciplinary research center, and then I call them sister centers with SCL because we work together uh, quite a bit with SCL uh, in, in complementary and a little bit of overlapping um, areas. Um, so I structured this talk in two parts. The first part is going to focus on some of the applications of operations research management science and quantitative methods in, in general in health systems. And then in the second part, we are going to look at uh, humanitarian systems. Um, so at any point in time, uh, I know this room is, is kind of may look a little bit intimidating, but please do uh, raise your hand, stop me and ask questions. Um, we can make this interactive, so don't be shy. Um, I'm happy to engage in discussions or questions as we go along. And I don't have to finish all the slides either, so we can stop whenever uh, we need to. So health systems. Um, we can think about different kinds of activities within the health system space. Some of these focus on prevention, basically focused on keeping people healthy and out of the hospitals and clinics and so on. Uh, the second uh, stream focuses on screening and diagnosis. Despite our best efforts, sometimes we cannot prevent disease. In those cases, it's important to um, be aware of these earlier so that we can actually take action. And then, of course, there is the treatment, which is the part that we all uh, think about probably when we think about health systems. It's more like the sick care versus health care uh, in, in, in large part. Uh, but that's also where a lot of activity happens, uh, especially from a logistics and supply chain uh, perspective. So the decisions that are made at these different stages, they impact both the individual patient's health, but they also have an impact on the population overall and on how we allocate uh, our limited resources and vice versa. The way we, we allocate our limited resources is also going to impact how we take actions or make decisions at each of these um, different stages. So, um, and you can imagine that we have multiple decision makers, multiple objectives, just like in supply chains in these systems, different players, sometimes all the objectives might not be 100% alike, aligned, so we still have some of these um, incentive alignment issues in health systems, just like we have them in supply chains. Um, the activities take place in different locations. So again, it's important to think about what we do in terms of the resources or services we provide in each of these different locations so that we achieve a good outcome uh, from an individual perspective and also from the population perspective as a whole. So, we have, um, our center has a, a, a lot of research in each of these different areas. So today, in the interest of time, I will just share with you a couple of examples. And, and these are um, coming from, from these different stages uh, when we think about the healthcare overall. Uh, but hopefully it will give you ideas about how we use these quantitative models in addressing some of these um, questions or decisions rather in, um, in health systems. So we'll talk about vaccinations, uh, which is on the preventive side, screening decisions, and then also more the treatment part with an example uh, that comes from surgery. Okay, so our first example is from prevention, catch-up scheduling for childhood vaccinations. Uh, you may remember getting vaccinated at some point when you were younger. Uh, this is the recommended vaccine schedule that's posted 
every year by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and also the American Academy of, of Pediatrics, basically saying here are the vaccines that we recommend for preventable vaccine, preventable diseases, and also the schedule for these vaccinations. So some of them are multiple doses that need to be taken at a particular uh, time. And if everybody follow this recommended vaccine schedule, I would just skip to the next topic uh, in my talk, but it turns out in the US, about half of the children fall behind with their vaccinations by age two. So it's a pretty large percentage of children who do not follow the schedule. And once a child is behind, then the healthcare provider needs to uh, create a personalized schedule for the child, considering the, ch the child's age, as well as the vaccination history. So for those of you who do uh, work or who are familiar with machine scheduling problems in manufacturing, there are a lot of parallels in, in this one and, and those <coughs> problems, but also some differences as well. For example, in terms of the gaps that we allow between vac successive vaccinations and so on and so forth. But it is essentially a, a scheduling problem. So, uh, and it's, it's a pretty difficult problem that historically healthcare providers try to solve manually. Often while the child is in the room, they kind of scramble through all these different rules and try to come up with a schedule. And, and many a times these schedules were not accurate. So when they were graded, say on a scale of one to six, uh, six being the best grade and one being the worst, uh, or I guess zero, the average grade would come up around 2.5. So the schedules they created were not accurate. And again, they are not to blame. It's just a difficult problem to solve, uh, to solve manually. So some of these uh, feasibility requirements I put up there, I'm not gonna go through them in general, but again, you will see several uh, parallels here between, uh, between the, the, the uh, uh, constraints here and what we might see, say, in, um, in machine scheduling from manufacturing. So the table in the back, uh, summarizes at a very high level some of these rules. And then there is a, this uh, red book that is updated every three years, which contains additional information about the constraints and, uh, and, and so on, which all need to be taken into account. So we collaborated with the CDC uh, in this particular project, and we developed a decision support tool that uh, takes in a child's individual history as well as age and creates a, a, an optimal and feasible, of course, catch-up schedule for that child. And the methodology that we use here for those of you who are taking classes in ISYE, you, you'll find these terms familiar. We use dynamic programming. Um, we show some structural results on dominance criteria, which actually enable us to solve these dynamic programs relatively quickly, whereas in reality, they may take a very long time but thanks to those results, we can solve them relatively quickly and, and get these optimal results within, um, within just a second. So um, this is just a, a screenshot of the decision support tool. Uh, again, you enter the va vaccination history uh, and, uh, and the age. And then you have the option here of choosing a routine schedule versus an accelerated schedule. The routine schedule is going to be uh, similar to the extent possible to the recommended schedule, of course, with some differences because the child is behind. Whereas the accelerated schedule might push the times of some of the vaccine doses a little bit earlier in time, still feasible, but to make sure that we kind of get ahead of the schedule a little bit um, in case we don't see this child sometime soon, that we will still make sure that they, they get their vaccinations in a timely, in a timely manner. And then the output resembles, again, the recommended schedule, so it's easy for parents and uh, healthcare providers to interpret the outcome, uh, basically showing uh, what are the administered doses, which ones are the uh, catch-up doses in red here, and then which are the on-time doses. So in this particular example, after this point in time, uh, the child is uh, basically back to the regular schedule because they were able to catch up uh, with their vaccinations. So um, the tool is available at this web website, httpsvaxscheduler.org. So please visit it. If you have uh, friends and family members with, with young children, recommend it to them. It actually works for children from zero to 18 years old. So even if the children are not that young, they may still need to get some vaccination. And um, 
any feedback suggestions uh, again would be most welcome if anybody tries it. Um, it's been up uh, uh, on this website and we update it every year again in collaboration with the CDC uh, as the vaccination schedule changes sometime from one year to the next so we do some updates uh, but more or less uh, the, the overall structure uh, remains the same. So the goal with this is to um, help uh, improve the vaccination rates, of course reduce the uh, the disease, the number of children getting sick, but also create more awareness about vaccinations in general uh, because the site also has a lot of links that, that provide detailed information um, about the pros and cons and vaccination. Uh, so we hope that overall it also contributes to um, vaccine awareness uh, in the country. So um, this was an example of how we use ORMS methods uh, at the individual patient level for prevention. So now let's go up to the public health level. Uh, so think about the entire population. And again, let's stay within the vaccination uh, prevention space and talk a little bit about resource allocation. So um, this is one of the areas where I think there are a lot of uh, commonalities between what we do in health systems and what we do in supply chains in the private sector. So we have certain goals that we want to achieve and we have limited resources. And the question is, how do we allocate these limited resources geographically and over time, considering different subpopulations in that area, so that we achieve these goals? So in supply chains, the goals might be we have demand and we want to meet the demand as best as possible to maximize our profits. So here is kind of slightly the other side of the, uh, of the coin, when we think about the infectious diseases, here you actually want to slow down the spread of the infectious diseases. So it's kind of like the other side of the, of the medallion, but the, sim the ideas are quite similar. So um, in the infectious disease space, we first developed models that will help us understand the spread of the disease geographically and over time, and sometimes also across different age groups, um, if we do nothing. So, like if we, if we do no intervention, how would this disease uh, take its course and spread across population? Uh, and some of these models have some similarities to say models in marketing that it will start slow, it will peak, and then eventually it will die down after everybody gets sick, there's nobody to infect unless it's, it's kind of a repeated uh, infection. And then we look at various intervention strategies uh, it can be vaccination, it can be distribution of antivirals, it can be um, educating the public uh, so that they can take certain measures to slow down the spread of the disease through their actions and so on. Uh, so these interventions, the goal here again, we have limited resources for these interventions. What is the best way to allocate them geographically and over time to keep the disease um, spread as small as possible and then hopefully make it go away? And then we may also have other resource allocation issues which are more along the lines of supporting. So for example, um, food. Suppose we have a limited availability of food because there's a big flu pandemic, um, uh, grocery stores close, and then we may need to distribute food that's not gonna impact necessarily the spread of the disease directly, but will impact how we support the population in such a situation, yes. What did you use to So um, methodology really depends on, on the particular disease we are studying as well as what we try to do. So I put a couple of examples here, pandemic flu, cholera, guinea worm, measles, malaria. So we have done quite a bit of work in the pandemic flu space. So there we use a fairly detailed uh, agent-based simulation model. Uh, modeling every person as an, in, in, as an agent in the simulation and also capturing the dynamics of the disease progression within the in individual over time. So you get the virus, you may or may not develop symptoms and then you kind of start slowly recovering and during this entire period you might actually infect someone if you interact with them. So we capture the progression within the individual but we also capture the interactions, for example, we are in the same room together that causes the possibility of, of something spreading. If you are living with people in the same household, family members, then the chances of spread is higher and so on and so forth. So this is kind of like the big picture framework that we use uh, 
in this <coughs> infectious disease modeling space, uh, developing these epidemiology models that help us <coughs> capture or understand uh, the spread of the disease, and then combining those models with these resource allocation optimization models so that we can simultaneously evaluate if we do this, how is the spread going to continue or, or slow down. So these are some of the examples uh, from that space. And I'm, if anybody is interested in any of these, I'm happy to share uh, uh, papers or other, other information based on our work and others. Uh, and today, in the interest of time, I'm only going to discuss one of these, uh, which is the spread of cholera. This was joint work with the, uh, with the Task Force for Global Health. How many of you have heard of Task Force for Global Health? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you. So it's a, uh, it's a large, uh, pretty large actually non-profit organization. It's based in Atlanta. Uh, most of the work that they do is in Africa. Um, so that's probably why some of you may not have heard, heard about them, but it's a, it's a pretty amazing organization uh, with significant impact in the public health space. So uh, we don't hear or think about cholera much in the United States, uh, but it is still a pretty significant issue in other parts of the world and affecting many people, causing deaths, uh, or just affecting the quality of life, uh, even if it, it doesn't kill uh, the patients. So it is treatable, uh, but sometimes access to treatment might not be available. And the consensus in the public health space is that the, the ultimate way to address cholera is to improve the infrastructure, the water sanitation infrastructure, because you can see the pathways uh, for, for the spread of cholera. It's basically not having clean water and sanitation contributes to the spread of the disease. So if we can fix the infrastructure, we basically, for the most part, take care of cholera. But fixing the infrastructure everywhere uh, is not necessarily feasible in the short term. So we also look at some other um, interventions, especially in case of an outbreak. So the specific intervention that we focused on is vaccination. It's, it's called the oral uh, cholera vaccine. And we would like to understand how to best allocate this vaccine, again, ge geographically and over time, so that we can keep the spread of the disease in check. So that's the question that we addressed. So a little bit of statistics. Um, um, about cholera. So what you will see uh, in this graph in a nutshell is that depending on the age, the impact is different and it uh, affects younger children more uh, in terms of number of infections or, or the number of deaths compared to older people. Um, and this is in part because of the way younger children behave. You know, they put their hands into something and then they put them in, into the mouth and so on and so forth. And also their immune system is not very well developed. So we see a a uh, disproportional impact on younger children. And then the colors of the bars also indicate the different regions. So we see uh, different levels of prevalence of cholera in different regions uh, around the world. And sometimes even within the same country, you might have prevalence levels that are different depending on the infrastructure, water sanitation infrastructure, as well as the availability or access to healthcare resources for treatment. So we see age-based differences, we see geographic uh, differences. Uh, so this is just showing uh, uh, some examples of how we might see differences depending also the, the physical um, structure, um, uh, water sources, and so on and so forth within, within a particular country. So again, our focus is on vaccination. And when we did this work a um, couple of years ago, there was really no systematic approach out there for allocating this oral cholera vaccine, uh, considering age and region, uh, as well as uh, other, uh, other aspects. So um, the methodology that we use for this is a, an integer program. So we incorporated some of these disease dynamics into that model. And we also incorporated the fact that uh, population, age, whoever is in the population, it changes. So for example, if we uh, vaccinate a two-year-old, it has an impact today, and then that two-year-old is going to grow, and the impact of that vaccination continues for up to five years. That's not like some of the other vaccines that protects your lifetime. It protects you for up to five years, but the impact or the protection level goes down over time. So we incorporated a lot of these dynamics about the population, 
uh, new uh, uh, children being born and added to the population, children growing up, and then also the vaccination impact um, decreasing over time. And then we created a multi-year model uh, to see the impact of different vaccination uh, strategies. So um, when it comes to vaccine allocation or the allocation of other healthcare resources such as antivirals and so on, uh, one strategy that we see um, uh, very frequently is called the population-based or pro-rata strategy. So basically, you allocate your limited resource proportional to the population in a particular area. This strategy is used, for example, when we have a shortage in the flu vaccine, whether it's the seasonal flu or it may be a pandemic flu, typically at the beginning of the season it's limited, that's how it's allocated to different, uh, to different regions. So while this sounds fair in some ways, um, it doesn't always give us the best results in terms of keeping the disease in check from the perspective of the entire population. So here uh, we uh, tested different strategies, what if we allocate by region, by uh, age, by population, proportion, and so on and so forth. Basically what we find is that um, if we simultaneously consider the region and the age uh, with a with a particular algorithm uh, prioritizing, we actually get the best results in terms of the number of cases prevented. Uh, significant difference between some of these other strategies that have been historically used um, in practice. So uh, what did we do about uh, this result? So the previous um, uh, topic I discussed with you, the um, catch-up scheduling for for vaccination. There we have a decision support tool that's out there that uh, parents and physicians have been using extensively. Uh, so that work turned into a decision support tool that's used by individuals. So what we have here, we don't have a decision support tool. We have some recommendations about how to best allocate these resources um, considering age and region. So we, we published our work and, and we also uh, contribute to the writing uh, of a report, uh, Comprehensive Integrated Strategy for Cholera Prevention and Control, uh, which became a, a guideline and we uh, wrote, uh, uh, our team wrote a particular section of that report spe specifically focusing on logistics supply chain aspects and resource allocation uh, in that space. And then we also presented our results um, uh, at the uh, Cholera Coalition uh, meeting uh, at the National Institutes of Health so that we can actually share these results uh, with the decision makers. So these are just some examples of how the research that we do here at Georgia Tech, um, we try to share it with, with others uh, to have impact. Either it may turn into a decision support tool or it may turn into recommendations that we share um, with the decision makers uh, to inform uh, their, their decisions and support their decisions. Um, so, again, I mentioned a couple other examples. Uh, malaria is one that we are currently uh, working on. We have a, um, actually a classroom game uh, based on malaria and how we might allocate the limited resources for indoor residual spraying. We play that game in several of our classes. It's Excel based and really fun and uh, uh, students get quite competitive. They, they divide into sub teams and uh, try to come up with the best strategy. But the idea is, again, uh, similar that we have limited resources, we need to have trucks and equipment and chemicals and whatnot, and the spread of malaria depends on the season, um, depends on the location, so how do we best allocate these resources to, again, minimize the number of uh, malaria infections. So we are currently collaborating with the CDC uh, on evaluating the in, in impact of an intervention strategy called PROACT, so this one is proactively visiting villages, especially those villages which do not have easy access to healthcare facilities um, and testing people who are exhibiting malaria symptoms rather than waiting for them to show up at a healthcare facility, which may be difficult from a logistics perspective. So we are looking at the impact of this uh, new intervention strategy and comparing with others that have been in place uh, for some time. So I already told, told you a little bit about the work that we have done in pandemic flu, um, looking at different aspects. So we have uh, 
one uh, paper that got published recently specifically looking at the allocation of inventory, again geographically and over time, also considering the uptake rates or the demand for vaccines uh, in different regions. And one other collaboration we currently have is, um, uh, is with the Carter Center uh, looking at the modeling of the guinea worm disease, uh, which, is, which is again one of those you know, diseases that is still unfortunately uh, prevalent in, in Africa, even though the numbers have been decreasing. Uh, so they started seeing an uptick of this disease, especially in dogs in recent years, and the human cases, the numbers of human cases have also been increasing. Uh, so we uh, have been collaborating with them on, again, understanding how the combination of different intervention strategies and allocation of limited resources might help us uh, keep this disease in check and eventually, hopefully, eradicate it. That's been their goal. Okay, so these are just some examples which I hope give you an idea about how these supply chain ideas are used in the public health space uh, with a slightly different uh, goal, looking at the other side of the medallion of keeping things in check versus, you know, uh, reaching as many people as possible, but similar uh, ideas. Okay, so now let's switch gears a little bit. If you've been sleeping up until this point, so you can wake up because I'm going to start discussing a different topic. Uh, so we talked about prevention through vaccinations and interventions and so on. So now let's talk a little bit about screening. Uh, so uh, in screening, the idea is that um, uh, we administer some tests. They could be blood tests, uh, they could be um, scans, maybe some combination. And then based on the results of those tests, the patient or the individual, they are not necessarily sick, the individual might be uh, labeled as high risk for a particular disease or low risk. If the test results suggest high risk, which often depends on some sort of threshold that we use, uh, so here is your number, and if you are above this threshold, we mark you as high risk, and if you are below that threshold, we mark you as, as, as low risk. Uh, so then if, if you are marked as high risk, then the physician might suggest some follow-up uh, action items. Some of these might include invasive procedures. So then there's a trade-off because these tests are not perfect. Um, the way we combine the results of these different tests and the way we choose this threshold is going to impact whether we have uh, how many false positives of, or false negatives we might have. So we don't always get a 100% uh, accurate result. So, so the general goal here is can we design some of these tests in a way that minimizes these false positives and false negatives and also informs the physicians and the patients in these decisions when there is a negative or a positive result, um, how to make the decision about whether or not to go for an invasive, uh, potentially invasive procedure as a next step. So fairly complicated decisions and again, uh, for the most part done uh, in the absence of any quantitative decision support, uh, but based on the um, values, preferences of the, of the patients, as well as the experience uh, of, the, of the physician. So this is an area where we try to bring in some, uh, again, systematic approach and quantitative methods. So uh, we've worked in this space on several different diseases. Some of, some of them focus on the individual level, uh, so here is a patient and what do we do for that particular patient? And some of these decisions also focus on the population level. So for example, uh, how often should we screen? Think about the recommendations. How often should we screen um, certain segments of the population uh, for this particular disease? Maybe you say everybody after age 50, screen them once a year. So these kinds of um, recommendations uh, typically use uh, decision support tools uh, or models and methods that come from RMS. Um, they could be at that level or they could be at the individual, individual level. So the example I'm going to discuss today comes from uh, uh, prenatal screening for, for Down syndrome. Um, I'll, I'll skip through this quickly just again in the interest of time so we can go to the second part. Uh, but essentially uh, this, this, is, uh, this is a condition that affects um, uh, again, uh, a significant number of pregnancies. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you are in the developed world or, or developing world, it's a chromosomal disease. And uh, there are some tests out there, uh, but, but most of the tests that are uh, widely used are not, again, 100% accurate. 
So we looked at the pre prenatal integrated screening. This is the most commonly used uh, test that's available. There are some better ones available now, but are only used for certain segments of the population. And again, the goal is to um, understand um, the, uh, the false negatives and the false positives, uh, and then see, depending on the age group and so on, uh, how these results are, are affected. So one of the things that we found out is that the cutoff value I mentioned to you, there's a threshold that's used, it's a single threshold regardless of age, uh, results in, in very different outcomes for different age groups. So in particular, uh, the false positive rate um, is, uh, is significantly higher for older women along with the detection rate. So this is one thing to keep in mind that there is not a, a good balance in terms of the false positives and and false, positive, false negatives across the age groups, but there's a significant uh, variability. So we um, looked at alternative threshold values, still staying with the single threshold uh, framework, and we found that there are some alternative thresholds that could actually minimize the overall number of adverse outcomes when we think about the entire population. So that's one uh, thing to, uh, to consider, why use 1 over 270 given today's population, if you could choose a different threshold that could actually overall give us better result. Um, another thing to consider is why consider only a single threshold and why not consider eight specific thresholds? Because that will clearly give us a better segmentation and better outcomes in terms of uh, uh, false positives and false negatives. So again, using Monte Carlo simulation and uh, two separate data sets uh, of, of clinical trials, uh, we are all able to show that if we use eight specific cutoffs, even if it's not for the individual age, but say for age groups, um, so maybe we use one cutoff for this age group, another one for this age group, and another one for this age group, so we go, let's say, from one cutoff to three or four cutoffs, we can still significantly improve the overall um, uh, accuracy in the sense that minimizing some of these adverse outcomes. And then finally, uh, we know that people have very different preferences uh, about the kinds of action they might want to take depending on the, on the test result. So instead of just telling them positive versus negative, can we give them some more information about where they are so that they can make a more informed decision considering their own preferences about potential next steps? Yes, I will do an invasive test or no, I'm not going to, right? So, that's kind of the main uh, question that, um, that is faced uh, by, by women and families at this stage. So towards that end, we have a prototype uh, a decision support tool, uh, which actually asks the user to rate, to first rank and then rate these different outcomes that are possible. Uh, so for example, having a, a healthy baby getting you know, no problem would be ranked at the top for almost everybody with a high rating. And then some of these other outcomes, depending on the, on the personal or family preferences, might differ from family to family. So we ask them to ra rate and rank these outcomes. And then depending on the ranking and ratings that they put in and their test results and the age, uh, we, we output uh, a particular um, uh, uh, point on the risk scale, but it's not a yes or no answer, zero or one, it's something along the spectrum uh, based on what they input. And then this gives them an idea about where they are currently, and if for some reason what they see doesn't seem to align with what they have in mind or what they feel, they can actually go back and revisit the way they enter their preferences, the ranking and ratings, and then they can see again how the results change. So this gives them a lot more information compared to just a zero one uh, high risk versus not high risk value, but it actually enables them to better assess their own preferences and, and uh, hopefully make a decision that's more aligned um, with their physical health as well as their values. So this is currently at the prototype uh, stage. Uh, we had one student last year who uh, spent the summer at the Mayo Clinic and we worked with the physicians there. Uh, to improve this and uh, they are currently uh, uh, in the process of uh, finalizing the steps for a pilot with their physicians and patients. So we are very excited about this. Hopefully uh, the pilot will start um, uh, in the coming months and then we'll, we'll get a bit more feedback 
uh, directly from the field. So this one, uh, from a methodology perspective, uh, you know, combines again simulation and some data analysis, uh, as I mentioned, from these two large critical uh, clinical trials. All right, so I'm going to pause here for just a second uh, before I go to my next topics. Any any questions? Any comments so far? Okay, so feel free to stop me at, at any point in time. So the next example is organ transplant um, decisions for patients and physicians. So this is in the treatment uh, stage. So we discussed prevention, we discussed screening. So now we are uh, going to discuss an example that's on treatment. So we have, um, this is a pretty large team uh, of faculty and students and also collaborators from CDC and more recently Emory University. We've been working on this, on this project for the past couple of years, very, very exciting. Um, so the motivation uh, comes from this uh, gap, growing gap between supply and demand uh, for organ transplant. So if you see here, uh, these are the number of patients on the wait list waiting for an organ transplant. And then here you can see the number of uh, uh, organs recovered or the number of transplants performed. Uh, and while our uh, supply has been relatively flat, our demand has been going up. So we see this increasing gap. Uh, between supply and demand. So at the same time, uh, a significant percentage of organs uh, which were um, deemed appropriate for transplant uh, or originally are actually discarded. So the way the process works, when an organ becomes available, a deceased donor organ becomes available for transplant, um, there are some algorithms out there um, uh, uh, adapted by UNOS and, and these organizations. For that particular organ, they will create a priority list of patients. And then the organ is offered starting from the top of the list. And if that patient and their physician decline, we'll go to the next patient, we'll go to the next patient, and so on. So if one of those patients accepts, they undergo transplant if everything matches. Uh, and if we keep going down, the clock is ticking, the time is passing, these organs can stay viable for transplant only for a certain amount of time, and if we keep hearing no, 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 the clock is ticking and we reach the end of the cold ischemia time, which means at that point we can no longer transplant this organ. So this happens more often than you might think, and actually leads uh, to a large number of organs being discarded. So one of the main reasons for this is that um, the code quality of the organ uh, really depends on the donor, on the donor characteristics. And the higher the quality, the higher the chances of a successful transplant and a healthy life post-transplant, at least if you look at the next five years or so. So if the patient and the physician jointly perceive the quality as not being as good, they might instead prefer to remain on the wait list until a better quality organ becomes available in the future. So that's the uh, trade-off faced by the patients and physicians. Uh, so when an organ is offered, we might accept, undergo transplant. Uh, to understand the implications of this decision, we need to have some idea about our post-transplant chances of survival, not just within one week, but maybe three months, one year, five years, and so on. Imagine all these calculations are happening in your head. Uh, if we decline, then we need to estimate our waitlist survival. If we remain on the waitlist, let's say, for another year, we don't know when the next organ is going to come. So we need to have some idea about when we might receive the next offer and have some idea about the kind of organ might be offered to us next time. And then if we undergo transplant at a future time with a different type of organ, the survival chances at that time, okay? So uh, typically, the decision of accept versus decline, uh, at least the decline decision, the physician has the first say when an offer comes in, say 2 a.m. in the morning, it might happen. You pick up the phone as a physician. If you decide this is not a good one, you may decline and you may not even discuss with your patient. If you think that the organ might be a, a good one, then you check with the patient, and if the patient is also okay, then you, you move forward with the, with the transplant. 
But imagine all of this is happening in your head, you're a physician and you need to juggle all this information about your patient characteristics, your organ characteristics and so on and so forth. And, you, and they, that's how you make that decision, literally, that's how that decision is made. So again, our goal here was to put some um, quantitative methods, primarily using machine learning methods around this and develop a decision support tool, uh, especially also considering that some of these organs are labeled as increased risk. Uh, about 20% of these organs have been labeled increased risk, for example, in 2014. This adds one more layer of complication. So the increased risk donor organs, they are tested for HIV, HCV, HPV. The test result comes out negative, but remember we said they are not 100% accurate there's a chance that this person may have, uh, uh, may have gotten this disease, let's say, over the past three days, and it's so soon that it's not showing up in the test yet, but we may still be concerned because of certain things you might know about this patient's cause of death or lifestyle and so on. So that's how the, some of these organs are labeled increased risk. So there is really nothing showing up in the test, but there is a very small, however small, possibility that there, there might be infection. So that further complicates the decision as to, you know, the quality looks great, but how do we decide given that we know there is um, increased risk? So we, um, we received data, a fairly large data set from UNOS that contains uh, every single organ transplant performed in the United States over the past 20 something years. And we basically utilized that data set to develop these predictive models um, to answer various questions and then most of these are, again, like I said, machine learning uh, models. So I'm just giving you a quick overview of the kinds of things that we have done. Uh, for example, for a given organ, uh, heart, liver, kidney, whichever it might be, we enter the donor characteristics, we enter the patient characteristics, and the decision support tool gives us these survival curves uh, for these different options. So here, uh, we again have a decision support tool. I know it's hard to see, but essentially it's collecting information uh, about the patient and an organ. Uh, the decision tree that I showed you earlier, uh, we have this offer in hand right now. How do, how do we decide um, considering the, the future? And then it will output these survival curves for the options of um, uh, yes, receive this organ right now and undergo transplant. This is how your survival curve looks like over, over the future days. Uh, wait for another organ. Uh, so maybe you wait and you estimate at about 800 days you might receive another offer and if you undergo transplant at that point, this is how your survival curve would, like, would look like. So now we actually put in uh, all of these thousands of data points into this mathematical model and instead of you doing all this calculation in your head, we can actually quantify and show you what the uh, potential implications of these different options are. And of course, we test these models on a lot of data for accuracy and, and so on. So where are we with this one? We, uh, we published some papers already on this work. We have a prototype decision support tool. Uh, we recently, this work has been supported by two grants by Arnold Foundation and Mason Trust Foundation. We are grateful to them uh, for their support. And we recently received a, a smaller uh, seed grant from HIPS that we'll actually start piloting this with, with MRA. But we already received informal uh, feedback from several physicians and improved the tool along the way. So hopefully this will also uh, move forward and uh, be used more, more widely in, um, in practice. Okay, so I'm gonna skip all of this and briefly tell you uh, uh, about another project. Uh, this is on the public health space. But this time, instead of allocating physical resources such as vaccines and so on, we are allocating human resources, which are also an important part of our, uh, of our supply chains, whether we are in the public health space or uh, in the um, uh, private sector space. So this is in collaboration with the CDC, Task Force for Global Health, and the Mozambique Ministry of Health. Uh, so here is our problem. Uh, Mozambique is a country where healthcare resources are very, very limited, and uh, hence allocation of these resources uh, to best match the demand are very important uh, in this environment. 
So when uh, healthcare workers, whether they are nurses or doctors uh, or, or other cadre, when they finish school, if they would like to work for a government post, they are assigned to a particular location by the government. And these assignments are made considering both the demand and the supply, so demand for different types of workers in different areas, and also who is already there, as well as who is graduating this year, and then an assignment is made. So historically, these assignments were made primarily considering the demand and supply, but not considering the preferences of the healthcare workers who just graduate from school. And clearly these are people, not widgets. We tell them to, to go to a particular location, they might go, but if that location is really not ideal for them, not preferable for them, they ask for relocation, or some of them actually do not show up to work and choose to work for, uh, for other organizations, which of course, again, negatively impacts the, the overall um, health system. So in our collaboration with them, uh, we um, uh, slightly changed the process or the input collection mechanism so that we actually collect information about the graduates uh, some in some rank order about where they would prefer to go. And then we develop a, a, an optimization model to create this best allocation considering different constraints and, and preferences and objectives and so on. Uh, and you can see a little bit of a screenshot. I know it's too small to see. Uh, but the results have been very positive. The Mozambique Ministry of Health has been using this uh, decision support tool uh, for the past uh, two, almost three years now. And I'll show you a little bit of the results, what we achieve uh, in terms of result. So this is uh, how their uh, allocation look like prior to using the tool. So the areas where you see red are areas where actually they are sending more people than needed to those areas for one reason or another. And then there are other areas here which are uh, colored light where we are really, really low in terms of meeting demand. So you see quite a bit of imbalance across the country when you look at these different districts or regions uh, and not doing a great job. So now we take similar input, but we are able to create an allocation that is actually significantly better and more balanced uh, ac across the entire country. So they've been very happy um, with, the, uh, with the tool and also the feedback that they received uh, from the healthcare workers has been quite positive uh, that they at least have this input that they can provide. And the majority, majority of them were uh, allocated to a location that was within their top three, top three choices. So we were able to create a better match between supply and demand without actually incurring extra cost or requiring extra resources uh, in this particular example. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this and uh, briefly talk about humanitarian systems. Any, before I go to the next part, any questions about the health systems? I know there was a lot of information, but um, any questions, any comments? Yes. Uh, can you elaborate on the collaboration with the, work with the Ministry of? Mozambique Ministry of Health? Yes. Yeah. So the um, Mozambique Ministry of Health uh, is, is the one who wanted to have a better way to mm -hmm. allocate these resources. Uh, so they were already collaborating on other aspects of health systems with the CDC and the Task Force for Global Health. And then that's how Georgia Tech came into the picture uh, to help them with this particular uh, piece uh, of uh, optimized resource allocation of healthcare workers. So that project originally started as a class project. Uh, I teach a, a master's level uh, project class in the spring. Uh, so we started the collaboration through that project, and then after the project ended, um, we actually continued working with them over uh, teleconference, uh, literally looking at the screen and getting feedback and doing some training and so on to, to develop and finalize the decision support tool. But we were able to bring it to a point of uh, being actually used in practice. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? Yes. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. So the question is, could our algorithm 
go through the list and actually pick the top 10 and 20 people who are more likely to benefit from this organ. So technically, yes. Uh, the, the current algorithm that's used by UNOS in a way does that. Um, and I mean, they, they also have you know, amazing people, obviously, have been working on this for some time. So they typically do not change that algorithm very often. So it's very difficult to come up with something that's going to be much, much better than what they do. Uh, and and, and in, impacting policy at that level is not that easy. Um, but the, the current algorithms already to, to a large extent do that when they crea create that prioritized list for a specific organ. So again, when we think about the, the priority list, it's not a static list. So every time an organ becomes available, for example, it will consider the location. And patients who are registered in that region, they jump higher. Uh, patients who are younger usually are ranked higher. So again, depending on the match. But it really looks at the combination of this particular organ. How should the priority list look like for this particular organ? So it's created specifically for that organ. That's what the current algorithms by UNOS do, or, or OPTN. Mm -hmm. uh, I can imagine as a, as, as a health worker in Mozambique, when you just graduate, you want to live in the big city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Not exactly, actually. So that's, that was part of the issue with the mismatch before. There are some people who actually want to go to some of the smaller areas because they have family there yeah. and they prefer to go. So some of those people with the previous matching algorithm may have ended up in a big city. There is somebody who want to be in a big city may end up in a smaller place. Yeah. So, so basically by eliciting these preferences, Clearly, you can do a better match compared to what you could do otherwise. Um, and, and again, if you, if you look at the numbers there, the, the percentage of people who are able to go to their top three choices is actually pretty high. Yeah. So I mean, I agree with you. There may be some preference about the big cities, but it's not across the board. So. Other questions, comments? Yes. So what's that happening when, when the preferences are very much skewed into sort of like Say more people want to be in the, in mm -hmm. the big cities. What, what, what does the algorithm do when we? So it will first and foremost look at the uh, demand supply match. <coughs> That's kind of the primary criteria, and then as a secondary criteria, it looks at the uh, at the um, at the preferences. So what we suggested to the to the government is to. Um, Keep, keep a record of these people who end up not going to their top three uh, choices. And then when they receive relocation requests, for example, they know that this person was not assigned to their top three choice. Now they could prioritize the people who didn't end up in their top three choice. This was also something that wasn't possible before because they didn't even know. Uh, and, and that's a way to prioritize the, um, the re relocation request. And if you are already in your you know, top choice, for whatever reason, if we have to move you, say, after five years, then again, this is a good information to have. You were in your number one choice for a while. Now, sorry, but we need to move you elsewhere. Uh, because they also do some movement of the, of the existing workers sometimes, not as much as here. So but that's a good question. Yeah. So this one is a batch because they graduate about the same time and then they receive their assignments. Uh, but then you can envision somewhere mid-year, if there are a lot of changes, movements, and whatnot, they could still do it. Or, or they could do it every time there's like large enough batch that graduates, but not at the individual level. So the, the, the match, uh, so what, what he's saying is that we have 90,000 people in the waitlist, let's say for kidney, 
but then we have uh, still thousands of kidneys being discarded. So for the most part, the reason they are discarded, and again, so when we talk about discard, so there are some that simply are not viable for transplant. We are not talking about those because they are, they are out of the system anyway. So the ones that are viable for transplant, that technically could have been transplanted, medically speaking, still are not accepted by anybody on the list within the limited amount of time, and then eventually they are discarded. So that in large part is happening because of this concern that the quality is not good. And for kidney, uh, here in this country, we have dialysis. So when you evaluate, again, without the support of a quantitative tool, you think, oh, you know, I'm on dialysis, I could stay on dialysis for a couple more months, no problem. But what is not that easy to, like, recognize with our limited human brain is that your, your health is deteriorating while you are in dialysis. Your quality of life is, is not as great. So what we find actually with, um, with this uh, work is these increased risk donor organs, as an example, they are discarded at a higher rate than those that are, that are not increased risk. And they typically come from donors who are younger, so the organ quality, quote unquote, tends to be better on average. Um, and yet they are discarded at a higher rate. So our work basically shows that uh, many of these organs that are currently discarded could be life-saving. Uh, so we have some, again, results that show in terms of numbers, if you transplanted, you know, X of these, you know, what, what the result could be. Not only in terms of saving the lives for the people who receive transplant, but also clearly you can envision you are taking some people out of the wait list, so now it's also easier. So essentially, you are increasing the supply, utilized supply. Yeah. So the algorithm takes as input an individual or, or donor, donor characteristics, and a particular patient's characteristics who has been offered that organ. And then for that specific pair, it generates these survival curves. If you say yes right now, what happens? What are the, you know, what's the survival curve? How does the survival curve look like? And then if you say no, then what's the survival curve look like? while you are on the wait list, and if you receive a transplant, say, later with an average organ. But the time with which you have to revert by saying that, yes, I will be going for this transplant or not. I mean, it, it's, again, it's assumed that you, um, you respond within the uh, feasible time for that organ to be still viable. Yeah. Uh, outside of that time limit, of course, you, you can't do it anyway. But that's in a way to help also with these decisions because typically you, the physician, the patient jointly may have up to an hour, let's say, to respond. And uh, again, it's very difficult to make that decision just in your head. Yeah, they, they do have a cut of time, so the, they give up to an hour, but many times they may receive an answer much sooner. Uh, some physicians actually put into the system, for example, they may say, if the organ has the following characteristics, no, automated. So it, in that case, it will automatically jump, bypass, and jump, go to the next person. So for some organs which are not of high quality because of these rules put into the system by physicians for that specific patient, we may actually bypass, I don't know, a thousand patients and then go down. So sometimes you'll see some organs, that's actually one of the things that we are looking at, they may go to someone who is like 10,000 in the list, uh, and then others go to someone who is in the top, top, top 100. So it really varies where it end up, ends up. Yeah. Uh, so uh, from what I understood, there are two reasons that organs get discarded. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So one is that Another is that everybody says no to it, right? So, uh, so your model would reduce discards uh, 
So the, the two cases why organs get discarded is, is kind of the same because each, each person has a limited amount of time during which they need to respond. The problem is that if too many people say no, uh, we keep going down, right? So then every time we go to a new person, we give them about an hour to think about. Even if they respond in 15 minutes and eventually say no, the clock is still ticking. So it's kind of the same. So it, we, nobody gets unlimited amount of time to give an answer. Everybody has a limited amount of time. The problem is if too many no's, even if they respond quickly, still time passes. Yeah. So with this, you would expect more people to say yes than correctly. So with this, especially for increased risk organs, because you can see quantitatively that they're actually pretty good from a survival perspective, if they take that into consideration, yes, we would expect less of these, especially increased risk donor organs, less of them being discarded. Because they tend to be, again, on average, better quality than the other ones, um, considering the donor's age and so on. So, uh, does the model take, uh, considers the uh, location of donor and receiver? So, if I'm assuming uh, this uh, system works on impression level, uh, if the analysis time, if the analysis time is more than 24, yeah. so how does this model take account? Yeah. The so, the question, does the model consider the location? So, the model just assumes that the match has been made. And the algorithm by UNOS OPT and that does the match, it does consider the location. So if the organ is offered to a particular patient, most likely they are in the same vicinity. Uh, only if we go down, down, down so much down the list and nobody in the region wants this organ, at that point it's offered to some other people that are maybe a little bit farther away, considering is there enough time. So you mean that the wait list it is different for every organ, actually. Right. So, I mean, the wait list is not different. So, you, you are on the wait list. It's, it's one big wait list. But the prioritized uh, list for a given organ, who is the top priority patient for this organ, who is the second top priority, that is customized for that specific organ at that time. Does that wait list change as for the donor's location? So, the, the wait list, the way the wait list changes is, I mean, people get added to the wait list. And then they are inserted somewhere for a given organ based on their condition uh, and location. Or people leave the wait list, they may die, they may get too sick to have a transplant, they may have a transplant. So the, the wait list itself changes dynamically, but the um, sorted wait list for a given organ, it's, it's for a given organ. So every time a new organ becomes available, we create a new sorted wait list specific for that organ, if that makes sense. So the, every time an organ becomes available, there is a new sorting. There is a new sorting. Because it depends, OK, so where is the donor? Where are the patients? So people who are nearby are going to get to the top of the list for that particular organ. Uh, the age of the donor, the age of the recipients, that impacts. The condition of the people in the wait list. So somebody maybe was doing great yesterday, today suddenly their health condition deteriorated. Maybe if we received this new organ yesterday, they would have been here in the wait list, but today they are higher up, if that makes sense. So it's really, we receive a new organ becomes available and then the, the prioritized list is created specifically for that organ at that time. So specific should be allocated Say it again? So the, the, uh, the wait time of the patients factors into it, how long they've been in the wait list, their current condition, age, all of these factors into the, into the prioritization. Yeah. OK, that's an excellent question. So suppose there's a patient who is more or less always somewhere at the top of the wait list currently. Uh, in the sorted wait list and then they keep saying no, 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 no. Do they get penalized in any way? The answer is no. They don't. So if... Right, but there is no penalty for that. So 
if if you are you know if you are in a critical condition but still able to wait a little bit uh, you know that most likely when the next organ becomes available you will still be high up in the wait list so it may actually be in your advantage to say no and wait for a better organ and you are not penalized for that currently yeah question uh, first off this is such fantastic work thank you <laughs> but it seems that there's so much interest that kind of hindered me from finishing the presentation. Yeah. I so think you also do something in the, uh, in the summer to help in mental logistics. Uh, you, you actually allowed me in my lab. Conference, yeah. So. Yeah, so that's true. So we have a conference. So let me maybe tell you just one slide, if we have time, uh, about some of the things that we do in the humanitarian system space. And um, I also am going to put some um, information here. So uh, this is some information about our center, some of the work that we do. And then this is another conference that we are collaborating and supporting just this year. So I'll put that information here. That's going to be here in Atlanta. So in the humanitarian side, uh, we do projects in two streams. Uh, one stream focuses on uh, natural and man-made disasters. There are many of them, and unfortunately not slowing down or going away. And then the other, of course, is these ongoing, we call them development problems, uh, food, water, shelter, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the environments here are multiple decision makers. There's uncertainty. There are disruptions. So in a lot of ways, you'll see the similarities between what's happening here in the space and also what happens typically in, in, in supply chains. So as I mentioned, different players, donors, recipient agency, which may be different than the, the agency that actually does the delivery in terms of delivering the aid. And then of course we have the demand, which is the uh, people in need. And we also sometimes have these other players that impact uh, you know, what, uh, how certain decisions are made. Uh, not always necessarily in the best interest of the, of the recipients or the system, but they impact um, some of these decisions, like the media. So whether we think this is a disaster response situation or we are thinking about an ongoing development, for example, establishing a water and sanitation infrastructure, um, we need some assessment. What do we need, where, how much, which changes over time. We need to mobilize resources, people resources, financial resources, physical resources, transportation, and of course distribution. So, and all these different decision makers. So you can see these are all fairly challenging logistics supply chain problems in a slightly different context than what you might currently look at in the, uh, in the private sector. So uh, very briefly in terms of disasters, we think about disasters in three stages or four. Uh, so we have the preparedness or mitigation stage. There are several activities that can be done there so that we actually minimize the impact that we see after the disaster. There is the immediate response phase after something happens. For example, a hurricane hits a particular area. We respond to help the population in that area. And then comes the post-disaster recovery, which kind of loops back into this uh, mitigation and preparedness because as we recover, we don't necessarily rebuild exactly the same way that we had before. So we kind of consider the future uh, in mind as well. So I, I won't go into the details here, but we have done work in this stage, for example, pre-positioning inventory. Uh, how do we pre-position different types of inventory in different areas around the world or in a particular region? And how do we mobilize that inventory post-disaster to have the best impact on the population? Uh, we have done some work in this space. I mean, of course, there is quite a bit of work in this area as well. But here, um, uh, maybe also across the intersection, uh, debris management is an area where we did a lot of work, post-disaster debris management. Um, uh, Yarit actually is working on a project that's motivated by that. Uh, so lots of debris is generated after a disaster. And it impacts. Um, people leaving the area, trying to escape the area. It impacts how we deliver goods and services into the area. So uh, again, given our limited resource, resources for clearance, uh, how do we allocate those resources to best clear out this debris, again, over time and geographically, uh, to see the best impact? So those are some of the areas that we worked on. And again, I'm happy to chat offline. I know we are pretty much at the end of our time, but uh, 
uh, happy to stay around and chat if, if there is interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you.